Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of Help Me Buy Property Podcast. We are discussing today how to find investment grade properties and what due diligence is involved in finding these properties. Now, understand that suburb selection does 70% of the heavy lifting when it comes to growth. This episode is divided into three parts. The first part that is what we are going to talk about today is the suburb selection and understanding the demand within that suburb. Now, if you're looking for a quick checklist or a due diligence checklist, please join our Facebook group or check out in the links below in the comments to get access to that due diligence checklist. Coming back to the topic, a demand is basically number of buyers looking to move into a particular suburb. So a demand would usually convert into rental pressures, which would then alter into buying pressures and subsequently into price increases. My co-host today is Cheryl Leong. Me and her will be discussing our experience in understanding the demand of the suburb. Stay tuned till the end and watch out because there are some real gold nuggets that Cheryl talks about at the very end. Thank you for listening in. How are you, Moss? How are you going? I am awesome. Excellent, excellent. So, Moss, this is the, the topic uh, that's on everyone's mind. How do we find great property? And when we find great property, how do we know it's great? So, just so we're clear, are we talking about finding the properties or are we talking about the deep diving once we've found those properties? Look, n- naturally, there are various stages of property investing. And so, if you take a step back and you think about property investing, um, I remember this quote from someone, I can't remember the name, but um, the the quote goes like, buying a, an investment property is super easy. You buy a house and you put a tenant in it. It's an investment yeah. property, right? Um, the idea is to get the outcomes that you desire from an investment property. And so uh, it's not so much about buying an investment property because technically everyone can do it. You know, if you have the money, just go out and buy something, right? Um, the idea is to find the right suburb and find the right property that is going to give yes. you the right outcomes. And so we are very focused on, you know, investment grade properties today. And we'll do another episode talking more about development properties. And that's a completely different ballgame, right? But when you talk about investment properties, naturally, you know, where you start is suburb selection. You know, you need to identify how to find the right suburb at the price point that you're looking at before you look at anything else. And so naturally that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where, okay, can we, you know, you talk about going step back. Let's step back a little bit further. And you said something uh, that that I really want to touch on, which is everyone can buy property. But not everyone Mm. thinks that they can, right? Because you go, True. you True. know, we 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 look and we start off, and I, you know, I shared a little bit about this from when when I had a, a session with you was around this whole mindset game around, oh my goodness, you know, Steve McKnight has bought two hundred properties in in seven years, or maybe it was three. Um, I could never be like him. How do we get to that point? So, how do we even before this whole, you know, we talk about the property side of things. You know, I reckon we should talk a bit around this mindset and this this thought around making sure that you are ready and that you can get to this oh, 100%. point of creating, creating the portfolio that you you dream of. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think a lot of people read a book, read an ebook, or or watch someone on social media, and they think, "Oh, I can't be that person." Well, you can. Mm. You you definitely can, right? They were normal people like you. You know, I I talk to so many people who say. Oh, Moss, you've done amazing. I don't think that I can become you. I'm like, well, I was a normal person like you. And I start sharing stories about what I was doing, where they are right now, right? And so it's all about, you know, following the right process, making the right decisions and getting to where you want to get to, right? You know, if you strategize this properly and you think this through, you can get there. A lot of the people, when they do property investing, they don't think, right? I was speaking to a client yesterday. And all they were talking about was how many mistakes have they made along the way. And, you know, they're talking about their last property and that was a mistake too. And I was like, Shit, wow, that's just crazy. And so the only reason that they were making mistakes was one, they were over procrastinating. Two, you know, there was no evidence behind their decision making. It's just a barbecue or a friend. And someone told me, oh, you buy this property and, you know, 12 months later, this would be $100,000 more. 
well, you might as well take this money and run up to a casino and put it on a raid, right? Mm. And mm. so there needs to be some sort of decision making involved in that process, um, some sort of evidence, some sort of analysis involved in that process to get you to an easier and a much more structured decision making. And that's where, you know, the due diligence comes in. Yeah. And, and I feel that that structured and focused decision making is a really good point around getting rid of all the noise that really holds you back from, from stepping forward into, because we all, you know, we're here because we want to grow, grow our portfolios. We want to build wealth from, from property. And the part that holds us back is the whole fight or flight. It, it's, you know, the sense of protection going, oh, it's risky or whatever that might be. That's what really holds us back and makes us procrastinate because it's that, that fear. And, and so I think what we need to really step into and, and focus on is if you are able to just hone down, block out the noise and stop thinking about comparing yourself to others, stop thinking about this person smarter than me or whatever, and just focus and go, this is what I'm working towards. And I'm going to surround myself with the people and surround myself with the education that's going to get me there and stop comparing myself to others and stop thinking that I'm not capable and just go, if I take a step at a time, a step at a time, because that's what it's all about, a step at a time and take the steps that we're going to be sharing with you, you will get closer and you will move towards what you are trying to achieve. And stop focusing on what you're not able to do and what you're incapable of and what you don't have and what everything else. And just go, actually, I have all the resources around me and I'm going to learn from, you know, the guys and experience, guys and girls out there that are sharing their knowledge through like platforms like this to be able to move forward. So I, what I'm saying is that whoever's listening to this and if you're thinking, you know, I can't do it, scrap that this you just need to focus just focus don't let the noise uh, distract you focus on each of the things that we're going to be sharing with you today Definitely. so that's my pep, my pep talk before 100%. we dive the meaty the meaty bit 100 percent. and just to add to that i think a lot of people reach out to property mentors property coaches property gurus or even property professionals in general is not because they can't do it themselves. Or of course, you know, there are people who don't want to do it themselves or don't have the time, expertise, or don't want to invest, right? And so they'll just reach out and say, I want done for you rather than do it myself. Um, but then there are people who would reach out to these people because it's almost like these people are there to take decisions on their behalf, right? They keep their accountability in check. They push their, that, them in that direction because if it wasn't for these people, for example, you wouldn't be making decisions because you are an over procrastinator or you analysis paralysis continuously. And so by the time you realize a particular suburb and you have that right knowledge and the right experience and you've selected the right suburb and the right property, you would still not make the decision. And the next thing you know, you're reading in the news eight months later, 12 months later, that this suburb has done amazing. And you're like, oh, I was thinking about this to buy there. Why didn't I yeah. buy there? And so again, you know, coming back to your point, structure, process, all of that, and it would just make your decision making process quite easy. Yeah, I like as we go through this, I really like to really highlight at what point you know, once you've ticked all those boxes, I'm just sort of thinking that like you're jumping off like a, a, a board. You've got to have a point where you're like, okay, I'm not going to hold back anymore, I need to take the leap. And so, we're going to talk about how we get in there. Anyway, let's dive into how 100%. do we find the suburbs, right? Because Australia, big country, lots of different states, lots of different suburbs. How do we even figure out where to focus on? Because I think that's another area where people get really stuck on. They're like, I don't know where to look. Yeah. And so, amazing. I, I think there is a, a suburb within a suburb. There is property markets within property markets. Australia is one of those real estate markets where you know, there is more than 13,000 suburbs and there is more than 13,000 markets um, when you yeah. talk about property markets, right? And so when you hear people talk about Melbourne is going down, there are suburbs within Melbourne that are still doing amazingly well. When you see, yeah. you know, Perth going up, there are suburbs in Perth which are still going down, right? You see Adelaide doing well. And I spoke to a client yesterday where she said that she has bought a property in Adelaide, held it for five years and that property has done nothing for them. And I was so surprised. I was like, wow. 
this is the best road the Perth has ever, um, Adelaide has ever seen in the last sort of 15 years. And so how did you win so wrong? And again, it came back to the same thinking. And so if you think about suburb selection, you know, the first thing to understand is um, how do you define a growth suburb versus a growth corridor? A lot of people, when they think about property investing, they focus on what I call is the growth corridors and media talks about it. Um, agents talk about it and there's a natural inclination for people to actually go into growth corridors because, you know, the land is cheap or there's big developers, you know, there is big uh, posters, there's big fancy, you know, fun days that they organize, uh, you know, the land is settling in two years, three years. And so it, they make it a bit of a fun, they make it an event and of course people get attracted to it. And so there is a massive difference between a growth corridor and a growth suburb. And let's explore those differences first. I'm a big supporter of buying in growth suburbs rather than growth corridors where, you know, people are focusing on off the plan properties or house and land packages. I am more focused, especially with the, this due diligence that we are talking about today, more focused on established property uh, where we are talking about land values and we'll, we'll help them understand as to how to identify the price points and how to, you know, pick up a price point for particular suburbs as well. But let's, let's explore growth corridors versus growth suburb. What do you think, Cheryl? Um, growth yeah. corridor, what, is, what comes to your mind? Growth corridor, when I'm, when I'm thinking growth corridor, often I'm thinking greenfield areas. So areas where they haven't been developed. So if you look at a map, they call it greenfield because it's all green and there used to be you know, pastures, farming, whatever that might be. And these are all the, the new land releases where you've got land lease documents, all these big developers that buy up, you know, to 200 acres of land and then they've got these beautiful new communities, which is amazing, which is amazing. I, mean, I think it's, it's wonderful. But the truth is the growth corridors, and they're going to have lots of new infrastructure and new activity going through it. However, because there's all this new product being released, it's going to take a while for property to generally increase in value because there's always so much competition. There's competition. 100%. It's wonderful. And I think it's wonderful for people who are looking for owner occupier, you know, young families. It, it often caters to the affordability market as well. This is why I think affordability market and you want new amenities and everything else, new schools and everything. Uh, I think it's it's really great for, like I said, families that want to live their owner occupier, the owner occupier market as well. And so, definitely, I say great corridors. Fantastic if probably you're a developer <laughs> that's looking to sell stuff for someone that's looking to hold stuff. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about the, the growth suburbs. Like what's the difference with a growth suburb? Isn't a growth corridor suburb going to be a growth suburb? And, and so that's a perfect um, segue from growth suburb to growth, uh, growth corridor to growth suburb. Now, what people don't realize is when they're thinking about property as an investment or as, as an asset, this asset performs like any normal asset. Higher demand, lower supply, prices go up, right? So this is macro uh, macroeconomics 101 right there. You know, the higher the demand, the lower the supply, the prices go up. The higher the supply, even the demand is high. But if the supply is even higher, like growth corridors, the demand never pushes the price pressure, never creates that price pressure uh, for you to see that equity growth that you're looking for. And so is it bad to buy in growth corridors? At the start, as a first home buyer, no, I think it's perfect. Do you never see any growth in growth corridors? No, that's not true as well. You would see growth in growth corridors, of course. But what tends to happen is that slowly and gradually, as the demand supersedes the supply and the developers are exiting out of these growth corridors, what tends to happen is these corridors turn into growth suburbs. What I call it is they, that they reach their maturity, okay? And so instead of you waiting for that transition to happen in, say, five years, eight years, 10 years, you can't predict how mm. fast or slow the developer is going to go. Uh, mm. You would rather focus on areas where the suburbs have matured already and you can identify the demand and the supply quite safely. And that's where the growth suburb concept comes into place. Now, mm. I use this analogy of um, ambulance. I've talked about ambulance in my previous podcast, but I'll use this analogy of a pressure cooker. And so this analogy of a pressure cooker is basically, you have a pressure cooker sitting on a stove, you put the veggies, you put the chicken, you know, people who 
who are non veg you know, or vegetarian, don't put chicken in there. You can put anything else. You put water in there, put the lid on, and you wait, right? And so you don't know what's happening inside, okay? The steam builds up, the steam builds up, the steam builds up. And the first thing that you see is or you hear is that little whistle, okay? And that's the real example of a growth suburb, okay? So you hear that little whistle is basically an indication that, hey, the demand and supply is happening in the area. Supply catches up demand. Demand catches up supply. Supply disappears. Demand starts growing. The pressure is building up. As the pressure is building up, you hear this little whistle. And that is the due diligence that we are going to talk about today. You hear this little whistle. And that little whistle is what you want to catch and buy in that suburb. As soon as you catch that little whistle, through the evidence-based investing, you go in and buy in those suburbs. What tends to happen majority of the times, and this is crazy, right? That people buy in the suburbs where the whistle is going bonkers. The whistle is just off the roof and people are going in there because media is talking about it, buyers agents are talking about it. And so it's important to understand that when you're talking about broad suburbs, that suburb is doing nothing right now. On the face value, you would see nothing, okay? And so you, sure. you go there and you be like, oh, okay. Nothing is happening, nothing extraordinary. You would see a lot of maybe road work happening, for example, okay? And so the real deal is when you, you know, go and attend auctions or you speak to the real estate agents, then we'll talk about some of these indicators as to what, you know, some of these indicators are for growth suburbs as well. On yeah. top of the due diligence, how do you quickly identify what a growth suburb looks like? Yeah, I just want to touch base again with the, the growth corridor. And I know that you mentioned it very, very um, briefly as well. As it does because our intention with um, buying property and investment is we want to take we want to take advantage of the equity uplift so we can do it again and again, right? And 100%. that's what Mark is talking about with these gross suburbs. Because if you you not that we're picking, you know, you are picking suburbs and, and timing. You 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 pick it on the uprise so that you're able to take advantage of the equity. And the difference with growth corridors, because it can tend to, if, you, if you're, you're one of the first purchases in a growth corridor, it will, it will rise because by the end of five years or eight years, that whole area has been built out and then that, that whole demand and supply. So you're, ha you're having to wait that five, you know, it might be three years, might be five years, but that's, that's the growth corridor. With the growth suburb, you want that to be within that one that one to two year time frame, and I'm pretty, you know, if I'm not wrong, that's what you guys look out for for your clients. Yes, definitely. So the idea is to be as grow as close to the growth cycle as possible, so that you can catch that short term growth to use that to build your portfolio faster. Now, ultimately, if you look at Australian property, long term Australian property prices, everything goes up. Okay, yeah. even if you buy graves, you know, the price of graves in 2014 was. 1650. I use this example quite often. Graves were 1650 in 2014. You look at a, a price of a grave, grave right now, they're close to about 9,950. You never have issues with your tenants when you own a grave. <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, if you're a really, really long term investor, you'll just go out and buy graves, right? And so, there's no issues with tenants, 100%. You know, no issues with demand and supply. You would always have a demand there. And yeah. so, you know, you're not in, the, in this game for a really long time. You want to make sure that you are catching the growth quicker so that you're using that to improve your lifestyle at the same time, right? You know, gone are those days where you think about, oh, I'm going to buy this property. I'm going to use my whole life to pay it off, you know, 50 years, 60 years of my life, and then use this as a retirement fund for the next 20 years or 30 years. The idea is to build your portfolio, enjoy your life, improve your life while you're doing all of this at the same time and that's what we're trying to portray or, or teach or mentor here so everything the, the question that everyone has is how do you pick the whistle how do you how do you listen out for the whistle yeah and so there are subtle changes that tends to happen uh, when you end up suburbs is transitioning out of growth suburbs or growth corridors to growth suburbs and then there are certain, and then again, not every growth suburb is, is the same. Every growth suburb is different at its maturity. Some growth suburbs have higher demand versus lower demand. And so when you're talking about transitions, let's talk about transitions first. And so you would see when a suburb is changing or transitioning, you would see rents rising slowly. You would see 
less and less right. rental stock on market. You, you would see, still see a lot of applications coming out for rental. You would see a lot of hits on each property. You would see um, less stock available for some of these properties available out in the market. And so as soon as they come in the market, they basically sell off quite quickly. Um, one of the key er- things of understanding the growth suburb is auctions. And so I used to think this all the time, especially when I was in Sydney and especially you know, when I came back to Melbourne, that you take yourself to 2014, 2013 Sydney, right? And you go to areas like Maryland's or you go to areas like Bankstown. And there used to be no auctions there, right? Everything was a private sale. And now everything is an auction. And Melbourne was the same. You go to a lot of west of Melbourne. You talk about areas like Point Coke or Williams Landing or Altona or even Williamstown at that time, 2010, 11, 12. There was no auctions. Everything was private sale. And so what tends to happen is that as suburb matures and the demand goes up, you can see the real estate agents pushing the auctions more and more. And you would see that trend coming through. And that gives you a really good indication that, hey, this suburb is ripe to take off. This suburb is ripe to go. And so as soon as, you know, one of my first indications when I first started looking at some of this data was, well, how does, you know, this whole suburb changes from a private sale to an auction? And so it just takes one agent to basically drive that change. And so I know that as soon as the first agent puts their hand up and, you know, does an auction, I know that this suburb is going to take off quite significantly. And so that was really early days of me doing some data analysis. But when you go down to granular data, we can talk about immense amount of information that we would talk about um, understanding the supply and the demands out of the equation. So most for, for us mere mortals who, who like to do a lot of research online and where's the first place we go to? Like where's the first place we really need to go to to go, okay, I want to have an overview of Australia so that I can hone down on the, on the state and then the, the, the suburbs and all of that. Where do you start? Look, ultimately, when you are thinking about finding a property or, or, or where to really look for, okay? I look at two things, understanding the price point. So what am I going to pay for a particular property or a particular area? And how do I narrow down on a, on a number of areas? Okay? And that's where I would usually, usually start. Okay? And so when you talk about the land prices, I mean, you talk about the property prices, um, I want to introduce this new concept. And I don't think that it's a new concept. A lot of people should know about this, but I'll still talk about this a bit. Um, which is called the land to asset ratio. You know, people, you know, you would hear professionals talk about, oh, you should buy as close to the land value as possible. Okay. Mm. And so there is a ratio called land to value ratio. What that basically means is, for example, you're buying a $300,000 land and a brand new $300,000 house that you build on it. The land to value ratio, the value is the house that you put on it, which is brand new, which is 300 divided by 600,000 because that's the total value of the house now, um, you get a 50% land to value ratio, okay? And so they are equally, pretty much equal. What you want to do is you want to move this ratio to the higher mark, you know? And so when I'm focusing on buying in any pocket at any price point, be it $400,000 or a million dollar price point, I want that ratio to sit well over 75 to 80%. Heck, in some times, you know, I would go over 100% as well, and I'll explain it how. And so what we're talking about is you want land to be valued more and the house to be valued less so that the asset to value ratio is more so that when you are trying to sell this or when you're trying to develop this or when you're trying to do something with this, you know that the land would appreciate or the land is where you would create the high best use at the future. I'll give you a very typical example. So we bought this house for a client. It's a, it's a land of 1,000 square um, just around December. And so 1,000 square meter land, you can subdivide this into three lots. And each lot, you can sell it around 300 to 350. And so if you look at the overall land value, it's well over you know, a million dollars. Okay? Or I would say close to at least you know, $900,000. Okay. We purchased this property at around 650k purchase price. And so you can understand that, okay, the land value of this house or this place is significantly higher than, you know, the house that's built on it. And so you're looking at well over 120% land to asset ratio. And that's where you should always start. 
a lot of people make that mistake of, oh, I'm going to do a comparative market analysis. Yeah, great. That's the next step. That's not your first step. Your first step should always be understanding, are you buying it at the right price? Is the area worth paying for? Is the land really that valuable? Or you are just giving into the hype because the area is priced up. Yeah, yeah. And I hear that that often, particularly with a lot of um, people from the eastern eastern seaboard buying in areas like Adelaide and Perth, and they're like, it's cheap because it's only, mm. you know, 350000 but I'll pay three seventy and 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 realize that, well, not realize that it's not value. That's not the value of the property, that it's cheap. But then, you know, you get, you get the uh, responses around, well, I'm going to hold it for 10 years anyhow which is fair, and then, you yes. know, you get an increase. Yes. Uh, but that, I think that's the point we're trying to make is not, you know, do your due diligence around is it fair value? You can pay that, but is it the value of the property? Yeah. And ultimately what's also important is if you're buying a property in a particular suburb, especially this is a strategy for auction, you don't want to over-invest or over-promise because if you have to come back into the same suburb, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot, right? And so I always say to the clients, you know, it, it's great value. You can pay an extra $50,000 for this property because I know you can afford it. But even if you pay 50 and there is an emotional investor at the other side or an emotional buyer at the other side and they go 100, now you've killed your basic plan to come back into this pocket because you have given a real estate agent a base case sale where they would be using this as a base case scenario saying, well, the growth has already happened in this area. And basically that's what happens, right? You see this a lot of the time, you know, it's little chunks of people paying excess money, which really defines or drives the short-term growth that comes out in a lot of these um, newer markets or a lot of these markets where the demand is significantly higher than the supply. Mm. And so in terms of um, data, Moss, in terms of, being able to identify the data. So if someone's based in Sydney and they're hearing a lot happening in Adelaide or a lot a lot that's happening in Perth at the moment, Perth is Perth is hot. It's so hot right now. <laughs> and yes. how do you how do you then determine Perth and then the suburbs within Perth that that we need to focus focus on? Because you know, yeah. how do we even find where that data is in terms of auctions and you know, uh, days on market, that, that sort of thing. And so once you've identified what the price point is and what price point are you looking at, especially with your budget, et cetera, yeah. what you need to identify is what I call is the demand of the particular area and a supply of the particular area, okay? And when you talk about demand side factors that you're looking at, you're looking at things like days on market, windows discount, online search interest, auction clearance rates. And we can go down in, uh, in a bit of detail explaining some of these, uh, but the most important out of all of these is potentially, I would say, days on market and the rent is proportion. Okay, those are the two most important. Online search interest, to some extent, of course, is very important because it indicates as to how many hits a particular property is getting. You know, there are suburbs where each property is getting more than 3,000 hits, and then there are suburbs where each property is getting only 40 hits. What it basically entails or indicates is how strongly people are looking into these particular areas. But rental yeah. proportion is something that I always counsel people to look at at first, because what you want to do is you want to focus on areas where, which are owner-occupied and owner-controlled areas. Okay? Yeah. So there is this fake sense around people that, of oh, if there is a lot of renters in an area, it's good because, hey, I'm not going to get any vacancies. And, you know, that's what the whole idea is from the property, right? Get as little vacancy as possible, right? But what people don't think is, well, vacancy is okay, but the whole notion of buying an investment property is not just not to keep it vacant, but also that it delivers growth, which means that people actually want to live here, okay? And so higher tenancy or higher proportion of renters does not mean that people want to live here. It naturally means that it's a much more affordable area. It could mean that as well. Or it's just housing commissions or low socioeconomic conditions that drive some of these you know, renters to basically stay here. And so one of the things that I always look at 
is areas which are owner occupied controlled where renters proportion is at least less than 35% nothing more than 35% because owner occupiers are the people who would drive the market hail rail sunshine floods etc doesn't matter because they have chosen to live in that area and so mm-hmm. if you can identify a demand for owner occupiers in a particular suburb that demand is there to stay it's not going to disappear school plays a big role you know in you know driving that owner occupier demands the proximity to infrastructure jobs precincts all of these drives um again gentrification drives a lot of influence when it comes to owner occupier suburbs as well yeah and you find that these areas tend to attract a higher quality of tenant that want to live longer as well because mm. as they're surrounded by owner occupiers they're more likely to treat the home like it's their own and so definitely. they're going to definitely stay to, to stay to stay longer as well so that's a good metric to be able to use so if you're looking at the number of uh, the, the percentage of investors versus owner occupier 30 i think you mentioned 30 35% you don't want to he- head any higher than that yes The next one is days on market. Everyone talks about days on market. Days on market is basically how long the property stays in the market for after it's been listed for sale. And what that's indicating is how quick the stock is moving. And the quicker the stock is moving that strongly indicates that there are more buyers in an area that are basically picking their stock out. And so you want to closely follow days on market. But again, when we're talking about some of these indicators you need to ensure that you are looking at these indicators on a trend and it's not yeah. a point in time a lot of people talk about these indicators i've seen buyers agents do that quite often or people do that quite often that they talk about it in a point in time it's not a point in time you need to see how the trend has eventuated over 12 24 36 48 months because what you want to clearly see from a days of market perspective for the trend to come off which clearly indicates that the demand is building up and what you want to see is on the flip side the supply is getting constrained so the harder the market becomes for people to buy the more naturally people would end up paying for that particular product or getting into the market um i use this example quite often that if there are 50 people if you go into a suburb and there are 50 people there bidding for one property and it was very often in edlade over 6 months ago there are still quite activeness there but you would hear from agents there are 50 offers on a property okay mm-hmm. and so you know that if you acquire this property there would be 49 people who would be highly can i say the word pissed or highly they would be super super angry right that they have missed out on the this property and so these 49 people plus an extra 10 or 20 people would basically go to the next property and they would repeat the same thing again and one person is going to get it and then the 49 becomes more frustrated and that frustration turns into price growth right that frustration yeah. turns into people paying an extra $20,000 extra $30,000 extra $50,000 and because they just have it enough right so yeah and that's what so you're trying to catch basically in the short term growth yeah so if you're if you're faced with that sort of market where you do have a property with 50 you know uh, 50 potential bidders or whatever that might be or offers like is it advisable to to step into that or step away from it because you're like you're competing with a lot of emotion there sure and so it's important to understand the fundamental so if fundamentally the area is right and you agree that you know this area is going to determine the growth because you know all the indicators are being checked you don't want to step away what you want to do is you want to get in and get in quick and get get out quick as well so you get in buy something and get out okay and so i'll use this example of modbury heights in 2017 18 when we started buying that we were buying there and this is it i'm talking about we buying there around 350 400,000 dollar price point modbury heights right now is close to about 650 700,000 basically that's how high it went in literally 3 years time okay And so there was a time where we were buying there for a client at around 525 30 mark and the client is like no no we have bought here like I've seen you buying here at 360 370 400 and so why are we paying this price and I said no there is more air that this area deserves it's not finished yet there is more growth that it has to pay 
and you were seeing that, you know, you were seeing 20 people, 30 people, 40 people coming out and offering on every property. And so the trick of the trade is that you understand the true value coming back to land asset value, understand where the land value is sitting and make a strong offer and get that property. And so you want to be that first person out of the lot of 50 that you get that property. Of course, don't be emotional. Don't be silly, you know, where you're paying an extra $100,000 over the asking price. But you want to be that person that pays an extra $5,000 when there's 50 people there and grab the property and go and sit. Because fundamentally, you know that that is right property for you. And that the rest of those 49 people would do the work, the God's work of pushing the prices up for you. Okay? And so it's not so much that you stay away from these areas. It's that, you know, ensure that fundamentally you're right. And then basically you go in, buy, get out. You know, and stay away. You know, if you know that the maturity has been hit, then stay away from that area. Yeah, yeah, and and just be and 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 have a clear strategy around that, and understand that pay that little bit, little bit extra, but then know that there's going to be a level of growth that's going to cover that is not a bad is not a bad yes. thing. So, how do you time the market 100%. in that sense? Because that's that's also market timing. And often we say, you know, is there can you time the market? Look, both of that is important, timing the market and time in the market, right? You know, pe- you hear people talking about oh, time in the market is more important and timing the market is not so much important. I personally feel that both of them is important. And, you know, once you understand the demand side of the equation, when you start talking about the supply side of the equation, you realize that timing the market is not that difficult. You can actually do that quite successfully with a lot of data that sits behind some of these things. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not, it does not require a lot of effort. You know, people who can comprehend data, collect this information and dissect it would be able to make a decision quite easily. Okay. Mm. It's just, um, you need a bit of dedication, a bit of consistency and a bit of understanding as to how some of these um, data works, you know, translating numbers into a story is important. You know, and understanding those correlations is the key. And so, so how do you, how do you go about going time? Like when you talk about timing the market, I and mean, we often see these property clocks, right? To be able to say, you know, this yeah, year, okay, this year. like how much do you guys rely on looking at that property clock to decide on where to buy? Look, I mean, I personally feel that their properties don't work in clocks. Okay. There is no linear fashion to growth. Um, the growth happens in chunks. Okay? It's not that a property is going to grow 5% or 6% or 7% every year uh, to infinity. That's not how it works. The property market works wonders. It would give you 20% growth and 30% growth and nothing for two years and then another 20% growth. What has happened in the last sort of three years is sort of an anomaly. You know, that's not usually a market works like this. Okay. Um, A lot of this was COVID related. A lot of this was people having a lot of money on hand, a lot of credit creation, you know, banks being extra hungry when riding that business. And so it was everything at play that drove the market up and all the indicators were there. But when you talk about market cycles and market timings, this is a long-term game. This is not a short-term game. Um, Mm. You don't see 50% growth every year on an ongoing basis, right? And so people who have achieved that, I call them opportunistic buyers and there is nothing wrong with being an opportunistic buyer, okay? So when you see a market taking a dip or where you see the market shrinking, those are the best opportunities to buy, right? You're timing the market perfectly. Well, like times right, like right now where everyone is scared, right? I was talking to a client yesterday and she did a lot of buying in in US and she said that I exited when GFC happened. And she said, although I knew that the market is going to come back, but I responded like a herd. And I came out and, and I realized now that, you know, that was a big mistake that I made. I should have gone back and gone in harder. And so it's a time like this where you know that this is an opportunity for you because you've done it time and time again. The only difference is that as interest rates rise, people get quite frustrated. People get a bit anxious. People get a bit scared because they don't have a strategy in place. They don't have buffers in place. And so that's why they can't hold on to these properties. They can't go back and actively buy in these areas. In normal times, when you're talking about timing the market, what you're basically looking at is the demand and the supply side of the indicators. And we'll talk about supply side of the indicators. But you're also looking at some of what I call it is the ripple effect. And so you would have seen this time and time again that there is 
there is a no known suburb out in the middle of pretty much everywhere okay so everything around that is a million dollar suburb and that suburb has done nothing and i i'll give you an example in melbourne and people who are from melbourne would relate to this i'll talk about glenroy okay or i'll talk about uh, hatfield and so you talk about those suburbs and you look suburbs around it like essendon oak park strathmore mm-hmm. and they're all million dollar suburbs they're hitting a million dollar mark and then you look at glenroy and does nothing literally next door suburb right and so you can see the gentrification coming through you can see the demand and supply coming through you know that the time is right you know that this is the perfect opportunity because this suburb is going to take off and disappear and so that's mm. the opportunity that you're talking about that's the opportunity that you're looking for same is the case with again I'll use another example from south this time of areas like Briar Hill and Mount Morency um, in Melbourne where you can see areas like Doncaster doing amazingly well you know all of those pockets of Doncaster and Doncaster East and coming closer to the city they've done significantly well and so when you talk about Mount Morency Briar Hill Eltham which are literally around that area and you see prices significantly lower you know that these suburbs are ripe for growth and i'm talking about you know 2018 19 20 you know those are the times when you know that this is ripe for growth you know i did a lot of investing there from a development perspective as well and so you would see countless examples of these areas where you know that this is the right choice but either you would shy away because you know uh, you don't have enough data or you can't make that assessment and the day you can make that assessment safely between the demand and the supply you would be making these decisions eyes closed <laughs>